We start a new sermon series today. It's titled Resilient Disciples. So we exist as a church to love God so that we can love others while cultivating resilient disciples, right? That's, that's why our church exists. And so like I said last week, I think it's only fair that you understand what's expected of a resilient disciple. And so we start out this week with that teaching series, and we'll be bringing that all the way up to, to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, getting, getting, I want to get you guys as prepared as possible to be able to serve the people that God has brought into our lives and actually living a life that looks a lot like Jesus. That's the hope. That's kind of what we are going for. And so I've titled this week's sermon, Set Apart. Set Apart. See, when I say set apart, I, I believe that every person that you meet is unique. I believe that every person that you meet has a purpose. I believe that every person that you come in contact with has a unique calling. For Christians, it's very specific. And, and I look at what the psalmist says in Psalm 139, 14. He says to God, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O Lord. My soul knows it very well. We are created unique by God. And it's an amazing thing. And, and maybe, maybe you've said to yourself, I just am too unique. I just don't fit in. I just really don't fit in. I think everybody that you meet at a certain point has said, I just don't fit in here. I'm just not a part of this. And, and maybe it bothers you. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Maybe when you were a student and you went to a new class and you're like, I'm not smart enough to be in this class. I just don't fit in here. I just don't belong here. Maybe, maybe you got a new job and, and you're doing some onboarding and, and you're trying to learn their systems and processes. And you're like, I just don't fit in here. This is I'm just not good enough to be here. I just don't understand what's needed. I just don't fit in here. Maybe, maybe you've moved. If, ever, if you've ever moved somewhere to a new city, to a new state, you're like, Man, I just don't fit in here. I'm just, I don't know. My, these aren't my people. And I, I just don't fit in. And, and if you've ever said that, you're, you're in good company because the early church said it a lot. When they came to Christ, their whole lives got flipped upside down because they didn't fit in. And that's what we're picking up today. Peter wrote this amazing letter called First Peter. It's his first letter, and he wrote it to these elect exiles, to those that had been kicked out of their homes because they didn't bow down to the Roman and Jewish ways. They stayed true to their Christian roots, and by doing that, they didn't fit in. They got kicked out of their homes and didn't fit in. So what I want us to do today is I want us to all answer a question that has a lot to do with fitting in. It has a lot to do with being set apart, and I want us to answer, what do I got to do to be set apart? Because I want us to be unique. I want us to be set apart. So let's read from 1 Peter 1, and we're only reading in 13 through 16 this morning. My brother Peter, he says this, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so, Lord, we just pray over this amazing text that you've given us this morning. And, and God, I pray that you would supernaturally do what only you can do by, by opening our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to see and to hear what it is that you want to speak to us this morning through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray this wouldn't just be another Sunday where we check it off the list and we got to go to church and got to hear a sermon and some cool songs. I, I pray, God, that you would... You would wreck us for what wrecks you, that you would take our hearts and you would move them and, and, and ground us in you and take this text so then we can go and live out what it means to be set apart for you. All this is for your glory and for our good, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So just re real quick, set the stage. Like I told you, he wrote this letter to the elect exiles, those who had been called by God to be Christians and kicked out of their homes because they wouldn't bow a knee to the culture's way. So then they got kicked out of their homes. They had to go to new areas, new cities, new jobs, new everything. And they just weren't really fitting in. And so he writes this letter to encourage them. Like, hey, keep the faith. Keep the hope. You got Jesus. You don't need anything else. You're going to be okay. And so what he's talking about in the text that we're about to pick up, I just want to kind of paint you a quick picture. He's talking about the prophets who longed to meet Jesus. These prophets that had promised that Jesus was coming and they'd been looking into it. Even the angels longed to look into who this Jesus, the Christ, was. And so we pick up right there in verse 13. It says in verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as I've taught you before, whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is it there 
for. Okay, so when you see that, you got to go to the text that's preceding. And Peter's talking about the prophets that promised that Jesus was coming, and they were looking into it. They were, they were craving to know who this Jesus was, and that's what it's, it's concluding that thought. Okay, so it's taking that verse, and it's concluding it right here by saying, therefore, and then he's got some calling for us. He says, I need you to prepare your minds for action. So to prepare in the Greek, it, the literal rendering is to gird up your loins. Has anybody ever said that? I'm going to gird up my loins. I never have, but I, I've prepared my mind for action. Just, you know, first century men and women, they used to wear these long robes, right? I think we should really bring robes back. I think we could rock it. Um, but if they wanted to run or if they were going to go into war, they had to gird up their loins. They had to get ready to go in. And so instead of me doing a, a working illustration for you, I'm going to lean on the artofmanliness.com and I'm going to show you kind of a visual of what it looks like to gird up your loins. So you can see it takes a little bit of work. You have to prepare to go to war. You have to prepare to run. You've got to prepare to do whatever it is that you're doing and the robe is no longer going to get in your way. I'm reminded of Elijah. He's fleeing from Jezebel in 1 Kings 18. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He would have had to do this exact same thing, put on his diaper and go run. He had to get ready to go. And this is kind of what, it, this is what Jesus wants us to know today. We got to be getting our minds ready for what's coming. We got to get our minds ready for action. It doesn't just happen. You don't have a good marriage if you don't prepare, if you don't plan. So you want to live out this life for Christ as a resilient disciple. You got to prepare your mind for action to get ready for what God's about to do. Have you ever gone on vacation? You plan, most of you, hopefully. Like you get your hotel, you get your flights, you figure out where you're going to be, right? You plan for that. You don't just go on vacation. You get married. You're going to get married. You get engaged. You got to plan, right? You got to put together what colors you want and the flowers and all that stuff. You've got to prepare for that. This is no different. You want to be a Christ follower? Start preparing for what's coming. Start preparing for action about what God is going to do. A resilient Christian invests, invest time preparing for what is coming. Basically, it just means pull your thoughts together. Pull your thoughts together. So to be a resilient disciple is to be very intentional. So I need us to answer this question. What do I got to do to be set apart? Prepare your minds to meet Jesus. And you do it on purpose. You're preparing your mind. It's not going to just happen. You got to prepare your mind and do it on purpose. You got to focus on what is important. You got to get excited about your faith and do it on purpose. So then I look at this text and I'm like, well, we got to prepare our minds. So then where's our minds at all day? If you're super honest, are you always thinking about the things of Jesus? Are you always preparing for glory and what's coming? Sometimes our minds go to the stock market or lack thereof, our bank account. Maybe your mind wanders off into your worries and everything that could go wrong. Maybe you find yourself thinking on and on about your kids or the broken relationships that you have or this didn't work or this was supposed to go this way and this didn't happen and your mind just starts going, right? And, and all of a sudden, you're, just in, you're, you're way out of where you should be because your mind has not been taken captive and, and surrendered as unto Christ. We could think about things all day long. But what are we supposed to think about? We're supposed to prepare our minds. So what are we supposed to think about? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul tells us in his letter to the church of Philippi, Philippians 4, 8, he says, I want you to think about these things, whatever's true. Paul says, I, I want you to think about whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is anything excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, you think about those things. That's where we put our minds, not on our problems, not on the storms in front of us, not in what's not going right for us, but we put our minds on the things of Jesus and we're preparing our minds for action. Preparing our minds to meet Jesus. And Peter goes one step further. He goes, not only do you need to prepare your minds, he's like, but you got to be sober-minded. You got to be self-controlled, it means. It's a big deal to Jesus. It's a big deal to Peter that a resilient disciple is sober-minded, is self controlled, clear mind, sound judgment. Why? Why is this such a big deal, Jesus? Why is this such a big deal, Peter? Well, I think, first of all, it looks a lot like Jesus to be self-controlled. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We know that, right? And it looks a lot like Jesus when we don't overindulge in anything. It just looks a lot like Jesus 
And I think second is, is when we're living a self-controlled life, we're literally living our lives in anticipation of Jesus Christ coming back. I don't, I don't ever want to meet Jesus if I'm not in the right mind. You know, my cousin got killed at the age of like 23 in a drunk driving accident. And his mom said, I can't believe he's got to meet his maker while he's drunk. I don't ever want to be out of my own mind when I go meet Jesus. On top of that, I put my life into the hands of the enemy when I'm not practicing self-control because I'm capable of doing some very dark sinning when I'm not in right mind. So we've got to be preparing our mind, not giving in to being overindulged. How, how blunt can I be? You don't look like Jesus when you're drunk. You don't look like Jesus when you're high. You don't look like Jesus when you're not in the right mind. You look a lot like the devil in that time. And that's not what he wants for resilient disciples. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. It doesn't look like Jesus. So if you want to look like Jesus, you've got to be self-controlled, sober-minded. But see, he's saying, don't, I don't want you to lose hope. Because oftentimes, I know that in our lives, we can get tired. We were praying this morning against, against being tired and against, against being discouraged and, and being distracted. It happens to all of us. And then the enemy can come in and he can do some whooping when we're feeling like that, right? But this is why we've got to set our hope fully on the grace of Christ. What he's talking about right here, set your hope fully on the grace, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do not be discouraged. There's good stuff coming. Do not be discouraged. There's good stuff right now. So set your hope fully on the grace that's going to be brought to you. It's this idea of hope. I love it. I love the idea of hope. They say one of the worst diseases is losing hope. You give up, but not with Jesus. we got to set our hope. It's doing it on purpose. And what are we setting it on? The grace, the unmerited, undeserved favor of Jesus Christ, including salvation, mercy, forgiveness, love, compassion. That grace that he brings us is where we set our hope. Don't set your hope in me. I'm going to let you down. Don't set your hope in your spouse. They're going to let you down. Don't, don't set your hope in your kids or your job or your bank account or your health. It's going to let you down. You set your hope on the grace of Christ. Nothing else. It's not bad to believe in each other and come alongside each other and share life together and be there for each other. Absolutely. Koinonia, a true fellowship in Jesus is awesome. But we set our hope on the grace of Jesus Christ. He will never, ever let us down. So to be a resilient disciple is to be hoping for something so much greater than yourself, so much bigger than you. So I want to answer this question, what do I got to do to be set apart? What do I got to do to be unique? And I'll tell you right now, it's looking for the glory of God. Not your glory, not what you can put together, but you're looking and you're living for His glory now and the glory that's going to be revealed when Jesus comes back for His kids, which He is going to. If you have ever said, I just, I just don't fit in, then I want to make sure that you just don't fit in for the right reasons. Not because you are overindulging, not because you are this or this or this. No, no, no. I want you to not fit in because you love Jesus so much. To be set apart looks a lot like Christ. It looks a lot like the early church who went through incredible persecution and exile because they love Jesus. I don't know how else to put it. If you're a Christian, you're not, just, you're not supposed to fit in. It's just, it's just, you're not. And, and I look at what, what my brother Paul says, Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the red, white, and blue. I love where we live. I think it's fantastic. But my citizenship is in heaven. Like, I live here. I love it. I'm, I, I think it's great. Super thankful. But it's not my final resting place. It's not where I'm really supposed to be totally comfortable. It's not where I'm supposed to totally fit in, because I'm supposed to be set apart. Okay, I'm supposed to be set apart. So are you. We're just passing through. That's what we need to be reminded about. We're just passing through. You ever go camping? You don't build a house when you go camping. You got the pup tent. You got the trailer. You got the RV. You got the hotel, whatever, glamping. But you're only there for a little bit, right? You're just passing through. That's all you're doing. And then you're going to go somewhere else. You're going to come home, whatever. But you're not, that's, not your, that's not your final place. This isn't our final place. We were made to be with him forever. And someday, Jesus, that is going to be amazing because that is going to come true. So don't stake your flag here. Be preparing your mind to meet Jesus. Be looking for the glory of God, and your life will literally follow this. Life isn't a Hallmark movie. Okay, It doesn't always end with the boy gets a girl. 
and they got the nice house and everything is great. It doesn't always work like that. There's hardships, there's discouragement. There are times where you're scratching your head and you're like, I did not see that one coming. And then we got to pick up the pieces with Jesus. But be encouraged today because we're setting our hope on the grace of Jesus Christ. We're setting our hope about what he's doing and what he's going to do. That's what a resilient disciple does. Set your hope fully on the grace. Because of the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's coming back. He's coming back. No more tears. No more pain. No more brokenness. No more sickness. He's coming back for his kids. Are you one of his kids? So Peter, he gives us this, this total beautiful picture of grace that we're being offered right now. This undeserved love, this undeserved gift right now, getting us ready. And, but what he wants to do, he wants us, Peter wants to give us a warning. He wants to give us a warning and then he's going to give us an encouragement. So he says in 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So he's building on this idea of hope. He's building on this idea of being set apart. And he says, he says but you got to be obedient children. Can I get a raise of hands? If any, does anybody just love a disobedient kid? Isn't that the best? Little nasty kid running around, doesn't listen to his mom and dad. Isn't that awesome? Nobody's raising their hand. Me neither. Okay? And so we're not supposed to be like that either because our Father in heaven, and that's who we're supposed to be obedient to. We don't get to be nasty little sinners. we got to be obedient children. So this is assumed that a resilient disciple is an obedient child of God. As obedient children of God the Father, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So what we got to do is we got to ask this question about being set apart. And as the old saying goes, if the proof is in the pudding, right? This is what proof is right here. Salvation always results in obedience. Salvation always results in obedience, not perfection. We talk about this often, progress, not perfection. None of us did it perfect this week. Thank you, Jesus, for Jesus. It's what we do. Saved by grace? Absolutely. Sola gratia. I love this Latin term that we are saved by grace alone. It's not about salvation. Salvation is a gift from God. So none of us can boast. We get that from God, but then we got to live it out, right? Jesus' little brother, James, he's like, so faith apart from works is dead. You obey. You do what he says. As a resilient disciple of Jesus Christ, we just do what he says, which makes us instantly set apart. Salvation always results in obedience. Romans 1.5, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of our faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ. Obedience of faith. We just got to be obedient children. That, that, that's what makes us partially resilient. It's what also makes us being set apart. So now he's talking to the obedient children of Jesus Christ. And he says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Ooh. Okay, okay. What do you mean, Peter? Don't be conformed. What, is, what does this mean? It means to be fashioned like something. To be modeled after something. It's this idea that you're, you're being molded by external and fleeting things. You're being molded not by Jesus, but by other things, by the culture around you, by your friend group. You average out with the five people you spend the most time with. You're averaging out. You're being fashioned. So be very careful about who's influencing your life. Is it Jesus or is it your homie? Okay, so we got to be very careful about what is forming us. And he says, do not be conformed. Instead, you're supposed to be set apart. This idea that we reject the ways of the world and we live in and we walk in obedience. It's just awesome. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This isn't, I'm not teaching you anything you probably don't know. However, you need to do this. Knowing and doing are completely separate things. 16 inches between your head and your heart can be a mile for some people. You may know things all day long, but until you're doing them, you're just being a Pharisee. You're just being somebody who knows a lot, listens to too many podcasts and doesn't apply them. Okay? So we got to be living this out, not being conformed to the world around us, to these passions, the, the passions of our former ignorance, it's our former lusts is what this means. It's, it's the strong, sinful desires that are not from the Lord that we gave into for years before we surrendered our life to Christ. I believe that God knew how much we needed to hear this because we used to chase whatever we wanted. My way, my kingdom, my pleasures, my everything, my, 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 my. That's not a resilient disciple. 
That's your former ignorance. That's before you knew Jesus Christ. That's before he changed your heart into his and, and drew you into him. God knows us. He knows that we need to be reminded because if we're really honest with each other, we can be tempted to go back to who we used to be. We may look back on our past with some rose-colored glasses, forgetting about all the pain that it caused other people. We may look back on, on, on some things with a little glee, and I'm going to tell you right now, that is not a resilient disciple. You were ignorant before you came to Jesus. Ignorant being, you just didn't know what he wanted of you. That's what it means. It's not an insult. You really didn't know. You were ignorant of the truth. He says, so don't go back. You've been saved from that. You've been redeemed from that. Don't go back to that. To be a resilient disciple, you got to be walking in this grace, right? Knowing that you're not going to do it perfect this week, but you're going to do it as good as you can because you got Jesus. So we just don't go back because now our eyes have been opened. We know what truth is. We understand Jesus' heart for us, and we know why he doesn't want us chasing all that other stuff. Do not be conformed. And so we got to answer this question, what do I got to do to be set apart? We chase Jesus, not sin. Do you know why? Because chasing Jesus leads to life. It leads to freedom. It leads to encouragement. It leads to holiness. It leads to wholeness. It's amazing. What does sin lead to? Death. Right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Hallelujah. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Chase Jesus, not sin. Peter tells us right now, stop chasing after your own sinful desires. Instead, as resilient disciples, just be chasing Jesus this, and just receive this unbelievable gift of Christ. Unbelievable gift of forgiveness. This unbelievable grace that you can't actually explain, but you can receive. Chase that. Don't go back to what you used to love before you loved him. This is why we gird up the loins of our mind. We gird up and we get prepared because if you fail to plan, you can plan to fail, okay? So we need to know going into situations, that used to be a trigger for me. I used to do this. I remember back in the day, that's what I used to do. So I'm going to go into that situation, and guess what? I'm, my, my, my mind's prepared. I've geared up my loins, right? I got my diaper on, and I am ready to run. I'm ready to fight. But you got to be prepared. Do not be conformed to the former ignorance, to the things that you used to do before you loved Jesus. And you know what I love about this? He's not asking any of us to do it completely perfect. He knows that none of us are going to do it completely perfect. So what are we going to do? We, we would still be chasing sin if it wasn't for the grace of Christ. Every one of us would be chasing after sin if it wasn't for the grace of Christ. So can we just find some deep gratitude for what he's done? Find some deep gratitude for him pulling us out of that miry pit and, and setting us on firm rock on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ? And that also means that we're going to be resilient and not go back. He doesn't want us to go back. He died and shed his own blood so that we did not have to go back, but we could be free in Jesus Christ. His grace changed everything. His grace changed everything. There's a lot of us sitting here today that used to walk in quite a bit of ignorance. I won't point fingers at you or myself, but every one of us did it. You know, maybe when you, you, were, you were younger, you used to steal things. And then you met Jesus, and you're like, I'm not supposed to do that anymore. Maybe you used to have sex with people who weren't your wife or your husband, and you're like, I'm not supposed to do that anymore. Maybe you used to, to get in fights all the time, and you were a brawler, and you're like, then I met Jesus, and I, I, I don't get to do that anymore. Cheated, selfish, lied, tried to fit in. We can go, we can keep going all day long about who we used to be, but that's no longer who we are. So we don't get to go back to that former ignorance. Do you know why? Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, for anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone away. Behold, the new has come. The proof, again, is in the pudding of being obedient and wanting Jesus more than our sin. Pretty simple. If you've been reborn by Jesus, you just don't chase sin. Now, Peter's going to bring it together for us and bring us an encouragement. He says, but as he was called you as holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. I love this. Do not read past the word you have been called by God. It means that you have been called by name. He knows your name. He knows you. And he called you. He called you. And, and it's this word picture that we're given in the original language of a shepherd. Right? This idea of a shepherd calling his sheep. Jesus talked about this in John 10, 27. 
Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He goes one step further. Jesus says, not only do they hear my voice, not only do they follow me, and I give them now eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Thank you, Jesus. That salvation that he gives, nobody gets to take away. Nobody gets to snatch them out of Jesus' hand because you're called by name. He says, I know you today. God gives the call. We do the responding. It says, but the, he who called you, he who called you is holy, and you've got to also be holy in all of your conduct. Holy, it's a good church word, right? Most of us have probably heard it. What does it really mean to be holy? Set apart. Set apart. You can go jump in on the Greek and do the original language and do all the searching you want. It means set apart. To be holy is to be set apart by God and for God. God's set apart from every other God. God is set apart from every other person. God is set apart from every other thing. God is holy. He's pure. He's sinless. He's unbelievable. He's completely set apart. And we're being called to that same thing. How am I supposed to do that? Glad you asked. We're going to unpack this. As a resilient disciple, we're being called to this same set-apartness, if you will. To be a resilient disciple of Jesus Christ means that you've been chosen by God, you've been set apart by God to be resilient. You've been chosen by God, you've been set apart by God to reflect Him. You've been chosen by God, you've been set apart by God to live for Him. Well, let's go. That's all He's asking. He says, be holy as I am holy. God is like, I'm completely set apart. I need you to not fit in. I need you to live your life in such a way that people aren't surprised when they find out that you go to church. I need you to live your life in such a way that what you're watching at home, what you're watching on the online, what you're doing on the socials, how you treat your kids, how you treat your spouse, how you treat your plumber, how you do everything needs to be set apart. It needs to be holy. It needs to look like Jesus. That's what resilient disciples do. God called his people to be holy because he is the one that is holy. Scholars always argue. Scholars argue all the time, obviously, but they argue over what is the greatest attribute of God? Is it his immutability? Is it his power? Is it his sovereignty? Is it his providence? Scholars often go back to the fact that God's greatest attribute, his greatest character, is that he's holy. Because it's also an adjective, right? They argue that this is one of his greatest attributes. And that's what he's given to us, and he's calling us to. He's like, I need this to be one of your greatest attributes. God calls his people out of a world of sin, from loving sin to hating our sin, to being this resilient disciple, so that we can answer this question, what do I got to do to be set apart? You got to love God more than your sin. Is there any sin in your life that you're just really not willing to give up? You're like, yeah, not that big of a deal. Yeah, well, you know what? That not big of a deal, but Jesus on the cross. So yeah, it is a big deal. Is there anything in there that, that just shouldn't be in there that you've been tolerating, that you've compartmentalized or compared yourself to somebody else? Well, I'm not nearly as bad as that guy. Pretty easy for us to do, isn't it? That's not being holy. That's not being set apart. That's us placating, us blaming, blame shifting. If you want to be a resilient disciple, you've got to do what the author of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Get rid of the sin. It's holding you back. It's bringing death, not life. Chase after Jesus, we're being told today. That's what resilient disciples do. This is his expectations for us. This is kind of Christianity 101. It really is. I don't think he's asking us anything that we can't actually chase after. It all starts by obeying his commands. Be holy in all of your conduct, in everything that you do. Be holy in all of your conduct because you have a responsibility to live out your faith. You have a responsibility because you've been chosen by Christ, because you've been set apart. Ephesians 1, 4 says, we should be holy and without blame before Him. Again, this isn't a Sunday thing. 
that we get to pull off for a couple of hours and fool our neighbors. This is lifestyle Christianity. This is resilient discipleship. I'll just put it as simple as possible. If you're doing a quick inventory of your life, doing a quick inventory check, if there's anything in your life that cannot glorify God, stop doing it. I don't know how else to put it. Anything. It doesn't matter what it is. You just got to stop doing it because it's sin and it's not what he wants for you. So if the Holy Spirit's kind of giving you a check on that, if the Holy Spirit's like, hey, remember we've been talking about this for a long time, it's got to go. And maybe today is that day for you where you can finally be freed of it. You shall be holy for I am holy. God's purity, he wants us to walk in it. God's perfection, he honestly wants us to walk in it. God's separated, God being perfect, he wants us to walk in this. We're never going to be God. Don't at all think that's what I'm saying. But we got to start acting a lot more like him, which means that we live a unique, set-apart life. God says today to each and every one of us, I, I am your father. I want you to be holy because I'm holy. Now start acting like my son Jesus. Get rid of anything that doesn't look like him and be set apart as this idea of a, of a resilient disciple. So we, we got to, again, answer this question. What do I got to do to be set apart? I, I think Peter set the table for us perfectly, right? It's about the mind. It's about planning. It's about walking in the confidence, the humble confidence of Jesus Christ. It's getting rid of things that don't look like him. Chasing Jesus, not our sin. He, he just laid it out for us. We're being called to obedience. We're being called to holiness. To be a resilient disciple, this is 101. You obey. You obey. For those of you that are Christians, you know as well as I do, we just, we're just not made for this world. Square peg in a round hole, it often feels like for me. It's supposed to be that way. Take comfort that they hated him first. They hated Jesus first. So they're going to hate you. You're not supposed to fit in. So this is how we're called to live our lives. We're supposed to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, internalize it, and then show it, share it, give it. I just think about the fact that every one of you in here and those that are going to listen online, I just want to be in heaven with them. I, I literally, I look at all, I want to be in heaven with each and every one of you. Every one of you. And who's that for? That's for God's kids. Those are for those that have surrendered their life to the gospel message, to this idea that Jesus Christ came and he, and he lived a sinless life for 33 years. He didn't do one thing wrong. He didn't even think anything bad. Can you imagine that? You don't even think about that. You don't prejudge somebody or typecast them. He didn't even do that. And the only way that we could be reconciled to God was through him because he was perfect. And so he took all of our sins upon his back. He took the wrath of God upon his own back and crawled up on that cross, taking our sin that we deserved to be the perfect sacrifice because there was no sin in him. And we know that it worked because Jesus was resurrected three days after. God raised him from the dead and put his stamp on it and said, this is my son now with whom I'm well pleased. We know that Jesus did all these things. There was over 500 people that witnessed his resurrection. They talked with him. They sat with him. They ate with him. Lots of eyewitnesses. And we know now that Jesus is back with God the Father, sitting at his right side, right hand, right there, interceding for us. He's praying for us by name. And we know from the scriptures that Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for his kids. And then he's going to take us home. So the question is, are you one of his kids? Because if not, all you got to do is repent of your sins and give your life to him. It's, that's, it's, that, it's that simple. Resilient disciples, we've got so much to look forward to. I get giddy when I think about heaven. My head kind of explodes a bit because I can't fully comprehend eternity. I'm not going to lie to you, but I get excited. I got so many, I can't wait to sit with these guys and just talk for hours or days or years or I don't know, whatever. It's going to be unbelievable. Was well, that what you meant? Oh, I totally did that one wrong. You know what I mean? It's going to be fantastic. But that's for God's kids. And so if you can hear my voice, if that means there's still opportunity for you to repent of your sins. If you can still hear my voice, it's still opportunity for you to accept the grace of Jesus Christ and receive his salvation. Amen? So Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity again to sit with your text that you've kept aside for 2,000 years so we can learn from it today. God, I thank you for the, the words that Peter gave us. And, and it wasn't always easy for Peter. I know that he, he did some things wrong. And I take comfort in that because every one of us in here 
have done some things wrong, and yet you show us the promise of your grace. You show us the promise of your love through the life of Peter. And God, the word that you've given us today to be set apart just like you are, to not fit in and to walk and chase after you, I appreciate that. And I pray that we would take this word today. We would fully surrender our lives to you and honestly just give up control. To be free in you, is there, there's no better place. So God, I thank you for taking all of us, all of our sins, all of our wrongs, all of our, our nastiness, and just washing it away with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Unworthy are we, but you are so good. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.